Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. September's here, which seems remarkable that it's already September. Um, this summer seemed to go very slow and very fast at the exact same time. I don't know if you felt the same way, but it really seemed to go fast but slow. And one thing that, you know, you hear about when you have kids is, is that it makes the days go slow, but the years go by quickly. And I think one of the reasons why the days go by so slowly is because most mornings you have to start your day by wrestling the toddler into their clothing. Like, if you've ever tried to put, like, clothes on a toddler, like, it is, like, top five hardest things to do on the planet. I think it's, like, brain um, surgery and then, like, putting clothes on a toddler, okay? Like, it is, like, extremely difficult. Why? Because I've never seen feet move so fast in my life. Like, they're kicking, and it's like you're dodging kicks, and elbows are coming, you're dodging them, and, like, you sometimes get one in the eye. Like, I came to church one day, and I literally had a busted lip because Jane's head smashed into my face, and then I was bleeding from my lip. Like, sometimes you leave getting clothes on a toddler, and you're like, I need a nap, right? But we obviously know that with kids and, well, as humans, clothing is a big part of our story, right? And today, I want to... You might be like, what are you talking about? But today I wanna I, I wanna talk about um, what the Bible says when it comes to what we're supposed to clothe ourselves in, what we're supposed to put on, and we're gonna be concluding our series today, the last part of our series, summer playlist. And again, I've had an incredible time uh, going through these and studying and learning this summer um, about some of our favorite verses as a church. You know, some verses that that like. Not that I forgot we're there, but like when you like see it again, you're like, wow, you know what I mean? You kind of like forget it's there, but you know it's there, like kind of that feeling. And, and this, this is the final verse we're going to go through, um, and it's in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 to 14, it says this. It says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, what compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against each other, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. It starts by saying putting on. In some translations it says clothe yourself. Put on, clothe yourself, and it lists some things that I think we all need to start clothing ourselves on a little bit more. That I think our culture and as humans, we need to start clothing ourselves. And what, it mean, what I think when I see clothe yourselves, put on, it means what are some people seeing when they see us? When people see you, are they seeing these things listed here? Are they seeing compassionate hearts? Are they seeing kindness? Are they seeing humility? Are they seeing meekness and patience? What do people see when they see you? Are we clothing ourselves? Are we putting on the things that God has called us to put on? And I don't know how many times, maybe you're the same way, you look at yourself and be like, man, I gotta put on some more patience today. I gotta put on some more humility today. I gotta start clothing myself in the right things. But these things are so tough to actually be what we're known for, right? We've got to clothe ourselves with these daily. And these verses come right after uh, Colossians 3, verse 5 to 11. And this is what it says to take off. It says in verse 5, put to death. Like it's not like a, think about it, it's like a death sentence on these things in your life. Therefore, I put to death, therefore, what is earthly to you, in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, uh, covetousness. That's a tough word for me to say. 
which is idolatry. That's easier. <laughs> On account of all these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked while you were living in them. But now you must put away, and this is it. He's saying, you put away with this, guess what? There's more. And this is where for some of us it gets even tougher. Put away anger and wrath and malice and slander and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, clothe yourself, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, and I love this part, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. It says, clothe yourself with this and rid yourself or put to death. And it lists some things that, again, I think a lot of us have deep struggles with. Some of these things that, 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 that have been a part of our story and we're trying to get rid of, we're trying to let go of, we're trying to be less angry, we're trying to stop lying, we're trying. But it seems like there's something getting in the way. And we're like, God, like, like how do I let go of this? How do I overcome this? It's been a battle for some of us year after year and some of us even decade after decade of dealing with some of these things that we're supposed to put aside our old self and take on this new self. Why well, I think it's so hard is because I think that sometimes it's easier to be angry than it is to be patient. Right? I think sometimes it's easier to lie than it is to tell the truth. And that's something we try and teach our kids. It's some of us. It's a struggle we've had for a long time. We lie to try and make ourselves feel better or about our numbers at work or whatever. And it's, it's so common as a part of the human story. But these are the things that as followers of Jesus, these are the things that at known Victory Church, these are the things that we are supposed to be known for. And in John 13, 35, right, what does it say? It says this, by this all people will know that you are to my disciples if you have love for one another. That's how people will know that we're disciples of Jesus. That's how people will know we follow Jesus. It's not by what church we go to. It's not about how we, how, how we are. They'll know that we're his followers based on how well we love one another. That's how they'll know that we follow Jesus. How we're going to be different than the world is if we love each other and take care of each other. And, take, and love and, and be connected and share and be generous. Like, like that's how they will know that we're followers of him. Not by our Instagram bio or the tattoos on our arms. But how we love. So what we're going to do is I'm going to try and go through each one of the things listed here in Colossians chapter 3. There's a few and I, I'm going to try and do it. And, and there's a lot, but I'm going to get it all done, all right? So number one is compassionate hearts. You know, Compassion International, maybe you know who Compassion International is, an incredible organization. This is how they define compassion. It says this, to have compassion means to empathize with someone who is suffering. And I think sometimes that's where we think the definition ends. But they add this part. They say, and to feel compelled to reduce the suffering. So what compassion is, is empath empathizing with somebody who has something going on, a struggle, whatever, and then actually having the ability or the idea or feeling compelled to actually reduce the suffering or to make a change or be the difference or make something happen. That compassion is, isn't always just about a feeling. Yes, we can be empathetic towards one another and to the world and, and bring Jesus, but are we actually willing to go and reduce the suffering that's happening around us? That's what compassion is defined as. And I think Jesus mastered this compassionate heart. And if you read in Matthew 15, verse 32, this is when Jesus feeds 4,000 people. I think it's the same compassion that we need to have, that even in the midst of our busyness, even in the midst of everything, we still have compassion. Then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion in the crowd because they've been now with me for three days and have nothing to eat. Now imagine you're at church for three days and you're just like, some of us is like, I got to get, like by noon, I got to get to my restaurant. Like three days. And they have nothing to eat. 
They're hungry. He's like, I have compassion on them. And I am unwilling to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. And the disciples said to him, where are we going to get enough bread to feed this crowd? It's such a desolate place. How are we going to feed them all? Sometimes that's how it is when it comes to five o'clock at our house. We're like, how are we going to feed them all? You look in your fridge like, man, like, there's not a lot in there right now. I just got to go do groceries. How are we going to feed them all? And Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? They said seven and a few small fish. Now, I love that because they were probably like sarcastically telling him. You know what I mean? Like, how are we going to feed them? I was like, what do you have? He's like, we got a couple loaves and some small fish. Like, we got to send them away. And directing the crowd to sit on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up seven baskets full of the broken pieces left over. It's a story we know. But this story, this miracle, this feeding actually happened from a place of compassion that Jesus had for people. So what happened is Jesus sees them and he knows they're hungry and he goes, what are we going to do about this? And he doesn't just tell his, think about it to himself. He goes, okay, what am I going to do? He goes, what are we going to do? What are you going to do? How are we going to feed these people? And what happens is they bring the limited resource they have, right? Some loaves and some fish and say, this is all we got. And from the small, God brought a massive miracle. I think sometimes we feel like we can't have compassion. We can't actually reduce the stress or we can't reduce it in someone's life. Why? Because we feel like we don't have the resources to do it. When we look around us, like, yeah, I don't have the money to go and, and feed them. I don't, I, I'm struggling on my own just to even get food in my own house. And, but the beauty about compassion is that when we bring the little we have into Jesus' hands, he can bring a mighty miracle. That it starts from a place of compassion and a willingness to be generous and a willingness to go and a willingness to see the need and meet the need. Because compassion isn't just a feeling. It's moving us from ignorance, not understanding, and moving us to action. What are we going to do about it now that we see it? So that's number one, compassionate hearts. Number two is kindness. You know, Mother Teresa, if you know who she is, I'm assuming you were one of the kindest humans. This is what she says. She says kindness is, she says, be the living expression of God's kindness. Kindness in your face, kindness in your eyes, and kindness in your smile. I think it's almost a reflection of clothe yourself. Put on kindness. That you might not have the money to give, but I think all of us have the smile to give. We have, I think, this place where we can be kind, even if our resources are limited. But I think sometimes we feel so under-resourced that we feel like we can't actually make a difference, so we don't do anything at all. In everything, we need to be kind. And in Matthew 5, 38, this is Jesus. He's talking about retaliation. He says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek. If anyone were to sue you and take off your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Now, the one I want to focus specifically on is this one where he talks about, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go two miles instead. And maybe you know kind of Roman culture, but at the time, the Roman guards had the ability to, to ask someone, say, not even ask, just tell them, hey, you're going to be carrying my bag one mile. Like, you don't have a choice. Like, going one mile, you're carrying my bag, and I'm doing some research. And there's a lot of debate on how much these, these kind of bags would weigh, what their kind of garb was. But some people say that it was anywhere from like 60 to 100 pounds. So imagine one day you're out for a nice stroll with your family. Guy's like, hey, guess what? It's time to carry my bag. One mile, 80 pounds. It's like my, my daughter's like 25 pounds, and I'm like, this is getting tough. You ever held a kid and realized how weak you are? Like I'll go to the gym and be like, yeah, I'm so strong. And then I'll get home and be like, i got to put you down. <laughs> like, you're going on my shoulders now, right? 
And a Roman mile was about 1.45 kilometers is what they say. And then, of course, you'd walk one mile. And then you'd have to turn back around and you'd have easy walk back, not carrying a bag. It's like freedom. But Jesus says, no. They can force you to go one mile, but they can't force you to go two. Go two. Now, imagine that. Like, who in their right mind would put themselves to that kind of suffering? The bare minimum. I'm going to do exactly what I need to do, but I'm not going to do what I must do. And Jesus says, no. One mile, go another mile. That means it's four miles. One, two, then back two more. Four miles. I think Jesus is saying, if you want to be a light in the world, if you want to take our power back, we take our power back through kindness. We take our power back with kindness. To do more than required. To do more than we're being asked. Kindness is powerful. Kindness, I think it takes our power back. Kindness changes our hearts and changes the hearts of those around us. Being kind. You know, this past Sunday we had a, a lady, uh, this past week, sorry, I think it was Thursday, we had a lady come into our church and in an act of humility she said, I, I, need, I, need, I, need, I need socks, I don't, I don't have socks. And I, and I was looking around, me and Harold were like, how do we have? And we didn't have any socks, but we, we, we had somebody who had given us some shoes maybe a year ago and we're like, hey, we got some shoes for you. So we gave her these shoes and. And then, then we offered her some coffee, and we gave her coffee, and we gave her water, and we gave her a bag, and we gave her another bag, and we just kind of gave her what we had. We gave her some underwear that we had. We gave her a Bible, and we prayed with her. And I think just how many times in my life have I missed out on opportunities to be kind to people? Because I didn't think I had what they needed, and it's like, we have to just give what we do have. Be kind to one another. Kindness is doing more than expected, doing more than being asked. Are you willing, am I willing to go the extra mile, to spend the extra money, to spend the extra time, to make the phone call that we've been putting off for so long? Are we willing to do it? And the next one is to talk about humility. Again, I'm trying to go through these so fast, it's so tough. Humility and this past summer, Beth and I, we went away. We went to Penticton, British Columbia. And uh, in Penticton, there's something called Peach Fest. I don't know if you've ever heard of Peach Fest. Um, the one thing I found out about Peach Fest, is, and maybe I didn't find it out, I, said, I didn't eat a peach while I was there. And I was kind of sad. Because I was like, I'm going to go to Peach Fest. I need a peach, and I didn't eat a peach. But while we were in Penticton at Peach Fest, it's kind of like K-Days, but just like way smaller, right? It's a smaller town. It had rides and food and... While we were there, there was this country band playing on the stage. And they had this big dance floor kind of in front of it. And I just see Jane. She sees the dance floor, and I'm not joking. Like, she turned into, like, Dash from The Incredibles. Like, boom, ran. Like, go. So she's dancing on the dance floor, and I was like, I'm going to go dance with my kid, right? I'm like, ev like, I'm like everyone's going to know how amazing of a dad I am. I'm dancing with my kid. I don't even like country music. So I go up and I grab her hands and I start dancing with her. She looks at me and goes, Dad, I want to dance by myself. For real. Like, I'm not, like, I wish this didn't happen. And then I had to have the humiliating walk back, right? Walking back and I'm just sitting there, like, not, like, really pouting, but, like, internally pouting. I'm like, man, like, that sucks, right? I wanted to go dance with her. I was like, I don't mind if I look crazy. I don't mind if I look this. And she's like, no, I want to dance by myself. You know, humility in our lives as, as people is this reality that you might not always be right. Right? You might not always be right. I think humility is us being willing to learn. It's admitting when we're wrong. It's asking for forgiveness. I think sometimes the hardest people we can ask for forgiveness in our life is our own kids. Sometimes I'll do something and Jane will be like, you have to be kind to me. And then I'll say, Jane, what you're doing is, isn't great. She's like, yeah, but God loves me even if I'm naughty. That's what she says. For real. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. But, but still. <laughs> 
Humility is asking for forgiveness and realizing we're not perfect. Allowing people to speak into our lives, allowing correction. In Proverbs 3, 34, a very famous verse, toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. You know, scorn means the feeling or ability or belief that someone or something is worthless or despicable. I think favor, if we want to see God move more in our life, humil- humility is a big way to do it. And one thing I've realized in my life is I can get humbled quick. Like that moment when I was trying to dance with my kid, and she's like, no. We can get humbled so fast. Favor comes into humility. The next one, meekness. You know, meek means humble, gentle, or mild. And I think this is the very nature of, of Jesus, this word meek, which is so unique when you think about the Savior of the world, identify and, and with, in the same breath, the word meek. The king and meek. Usually those two things are, are like oxymorons. They don't really fit together. Philippians 2, 5 to 8 says this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not count equally with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The most humiliating death you could go through is the one Jesus did for us. This word, meek and savior. See, Jesus gave up his power. He gave up his his space. He gave it, became humble and meek. Still had the power, but he chose to use serving instead. Gave it all up to take care of us. I think the more of ourselves that we give up, the more we become like Jesus. The, the more we put off, we put to death those things, and we put on the right things, the more we become like Jesus. And I think when we read these verses, it's kind of encouraging, but then we realize how much work some of this actually takes to make happen. Loving people, even if they can offer us nothing. We've got to learn how to be meek, humble, gentle. And the next one here is, is patience. And I'm talking about patient when people don't get it right the first time. Patient when we share our opinion and we know what someone needs to do to actually not get in trouble or to find healing and they do the opposite of what we tell them. It's tough to be patient in those moments. Patient when our children aren't listening. I think in some ways, when I look at the word patient, how I view it in a lot of ways is to not be in a hurry. You know, in our culture, we talked a little bit about busyness, I think a couple weeks ago, last week. But if you notice this, in our culture, we're always rushing. Like always. We're always in a rush. We're leaving late and then we're stressed the whole way to an appointment. Or we're leaving late and we're stressed the whole way coming to church. We're, we're, we're angry because we're going to be late. And we've we got all these things. We're rushing everywhere we go. We're rushing from one meeting to another. Rushing to work because we slept in. Rushing to the grocery store because we forgot that one ingredient we need for our meal. And our guests are about to come. We've got to run to the store to make sure we have the right ingredients to cook the meal. We're rushing to pick up our kids from school because we got caught up at work and didn't realize what time it was. And we try and make up time by rushing everywhere we go. That's how we think we can make up time, we can add more time to our day as if we're in a rush. But if you've noticed in life when you're rushing, things, the quality of your performance usually goes down. We can't always be in a rush. This is what Peter said in 2 Peter 3, verse 8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count as slowness, but he is patient towards you, 
not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. These humans were limited by time, right? By seconds and minutes and hours and days and weeks and years, months. We want everything to happen in our own timing. And so what we do is we rush, we get stressed, we stop resting, because we got to fit it all in into our tight schedules because we're limited by time. But see, God isn't confined to the same restrictions of time that we are. And so we think he's supposed to do something in our time. He's like, you just don't see it yet. You've got to be patient. Just God is eternal and he's outside of it. So what we deem as slow isn't actually slow. And what we deem as fast isn't actually maybe so fast. We have to learn to be patient in the same way that God is patient towards us. To learn how to relax. To learn how to slow down. To learn how to not always be in a rush. Because I think oftentimes when we're in a rush, we miss out on the blessings and the beauty that's around us. You ever been driving and then the passenger's like, you should see the sunset because you didn't even see it? Now I'm not saying like watch the sunset the whole time you're driving. That's not what I'm saying. But when we're rushing, when we're busy, we miss out on the beauty. Right? We miss out on, on the things around us. My sister, when she was a kid, I don't know if your kids did this, and my kids don't yet. But my sister would just, she's three or four years old, she'd just look out the window and sing about everything she saw. She'd be like, I see the fence and the horses and the hay, like, like that. And the sky, right? Like that. I mean, I'm a better singer than her, to be honest. I'm just joking. <laughs> Sorry. That's, she, she, what I love about that is she saw the beauty around her because she wasn't so stressed out. You notice how kids, they're usually not in a rush when they're supposed to be? It's like, We're late for school. Get your shoes on. And yet they're just like dancing in the living room. And you're like, get your shoes on. And then they come out and it's like, you got one crock on and one boot on. Like it's not going to work. It's like it's, it's, it's 35 degrees outside and you're wearing your snow boots. Stop. And she's like, my feet are sweaty. I'm like, yeah, I know. You know, I think in so many ways when God says to be like little children, it's very important that we do that. Like, again, we become so impatient about the smallest things that, to be honest, have no eternal value, that have no eternal consequences. But we make them a massive deal because we're rushing. And then the next one here is bearing with one another. We all have weaknesses. We all have blind spots in our life. We all have things that we're not proud of. We have things about us that we're like, yeah, I'm trying to grow in. I can sometimes be abrasive. I can sometimes, you know, raise my voice. Or I can sometimes do this. I can sometimes do that. And we all have weaknesses. 2 Corinthians, verse 12, verse 9 to 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ then I am content with my weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, he is strong. See, in our world, even for us, we see weakness in people and we think, that's probably not going to work in this context. You got to get better if you want to be here. We don't realize that in their weakness, just like in my weakness, his power comes and I'm made strong, not in my own ability. It's the same for other people. If we want to learn to bear with one another, it's being patient with them in the midst of them overcoming and dealing with some of the things in their life. But we don't like to wait because we got the answers. We got all, we got the way to fix it. And rather for us, and rather for us to try and fix it all, we need to be patient with people as they work through it. We all have things in our life that we need other people to bear. And when you're married, you learn a lot about how weak you are. How many times I, I know the things I'm supposed to do, yet it feels like I'm not hearing the things I know I need to do, and then I do the things I know I'm not supposed to do. And bearing with one another is... Being patient 
and being willing to walk with people as they overcome some of the weakness in their life and help them through it all. That's what Jesus did, right? This is for Paul. He's like, my grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient for you, and it's also sufficient for them. I think sometimes we like to receive God's grace ourselves, but we don't like other people to experience it. We want them to experience our wrath. We've got to bear with one another. And I'm the kind of person that will tell you if you have lettuce stuck in your teeth. I will. I'll tell you if your zipper's down. I'll tell you. Because I don't know how many times I've gone into the bathroom and realized I had an entire Caprese salad in my, in my teeth. You know what I'm talking about? You're like, I've been talking to people for five hours and I realize, like, it's not the best situation going on, you know? And why I tell you? And this is, like, so random of a thought. But I'll tell you because in the context of those are small things, but sometimes the big things, we need to be willing to tell each other when there's blind spots. What blind spots are is things we don't even see that are actually negative. And help each other overcome them and be patient when we try and overcome them. And then the next one is forgiving one another. You know, I believe that unforgiveness and bitterness are like a prison that we build ourselves in. And we think it's affecting other people, but it's only affecting us. And I don't think it's the actions of other people that hold us captive. It's our heart's attitude that holds us captive. I'm not saying that the trauma and pain and stuff in our life is good, but what I'm saying is freedom will only come through forgiveness. As hard as those moments were, as traumatic as they were, we need to find to get into a place in our heart where we start to forgive. And I'm not saying forgiveness is easy. I'm not saying it's easy to forgive the actions of people that were horrible things. But forgiveness is so important. You know, bitterness is like a poison that's killing us and we don't even realize it. We're thinking that if I don't forgive, they're getting what they deserve. Yet it's only destroying us. And then what happens is we start putting up walls around us saying, I'm not going to let anyone close again. I've been so hurt. I know so many people who have, so many people like that, that have people in their life Lots of people that they don't have a relationship where they don't talk to anymore because of something they texted them in high school. Like for real. Like people who are like, I hate them because they texted me something that really hurt me. And I'm not saying it was easy. But so many people have so many broken relationships. It's almost like they leave a trail of broken relationships in their life. And now they're so bitter and so angry that unforgiveness is really the only solution that we can find. In fact, I think forgiveness is supposed to be a daily practice. And why I say this is in Mark in Mark eleven twenty three to twenty five, talking about faith. It says, "Truly, tr- truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him." Verse twenty four. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe and you will receive it and it will be yours. For this is where it says this. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. When in the same breath of faith is also forgiveness. Faith to move the mountains. Sometimes the hardest mountain to move is the bitterness and unforgiveness in our own hearts. Maybe we're dreaming for something so powerful, but God's like, we got to deal with the mountain first. Of unforgiveness in our lives. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, forgive. So in the same conversation on prayer, Jesus talks about faith to move mountains and forgiveness to break chains. In the same conversation. I think it's time for us to forgive. It's time for us to break the change. It's time for us to ask the mountains to move. You know, I want to invite up Mariah to play some keyboards. But the last thing in that verse we started at the beginning is this word love. Right, love. When we think about love, love is the glue that holds everything together. 
Love is all of this list combined into the last thing. It's the reason why we do these things. We don't just forgive because the Bible tells us to forgive. We forgive because we love. So I think as humans, as, as, as followers of Jesus, let us be known by how we love one another. Let us put on love above all. Let's be known by how patient we are and how meek we are. Let's be known by what we love and not be known by what we hate. We gotta be known by what we're for more than we need to be known, I think, by what we're against. We gotta be known for the most important thing, Jesus. Do we clothe ourselves? Do we put on these things? meaning that they are seen when we walk into a room and they're seen when we walk into our work or we walk into church or we go to Tim Hortons. They're seen by those around us. No, seen by our spouses and seen by our kids and by our coworkers and the other drivers on the road and by our bosses and no, seen by our parents and seen by the bus driver and seen by the server who brought you the wrong meal. seen by the doctors and the nurses and seen by our friends and seen by our enemies. Put on these things. Make it clear in your life. Let these things stand out. This is what we're supposed to wear. This is what we're supposed to be known for, these things. You know, our takeaway today is actually a question. And this is, is what do people see when they see me? What do people see? Do they see anger? Do they see wrath? Do they see malice? Do they see slander? Do they see obscene talk? Do they see impurity? Sexual immorality? Idolatry? What do people see when they see you? I think for us, we've got to look in the mirror sometimes. We've got to take those things off. And clothe ourselves with compassionate hearts. And clothe ourselves with kindness and humility and meekness and patience. Bearing with one another together. And forgiving one another. And above all, love. You know, imagine with me a community where this was the center. Not just a theory. but in a tangible way where we can feel it, we can see it, we can experience this love. Where it wasn't about your past, it wasn't about your issues, it wasn't about your weakness, but it was all about Jesus. And no matter belief, no matter sin, no matter fear, no matter anxiety, that love reigns so deeply at its core. And at our church, at known this is our heart. That first of all, we exist to make Jesus known, of course. But number two, is to be a place that anyone can call home. So what we want to be about is a place where people can find freedom. That they can come in so broken like I think a lot of us have. We've come in so broken, maybe not just our church, but to a church we've come in so broken, yet we find exactly what we need. A place where we can eat a meal together, where we can talk, where we can correct each other, but be meek and be patient. That's what we want to be about. A place where we can call home. So my prayer for us today is that we will do this. That we will clothe ourselves with these things. And I know it's hard, like getting a toddler dressed in the morning. Sometimes putting on our patient hat in the morning can be tough. Sometimes it's a struggle. Sometimes it's hard. But we also know it's right and beautiful when we can do it. 
So Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you that as we step into this, this new fall season, God, that I pray that you help us all clothe ourselves with more of you, that when people see us, they do see patience, even when we're frustrated. That they see love, even when we're angry. That we learn how to show our anger in a loving way. And God, I pray again that as people see us, they see you more than anything. And God, I thank you that, that, that as we continue to build your church, as you build your church here at Known, God, I pray that this will be a place, we declare it will be a place that people can call home, no matter what. That they will come in here and they'll feel like they're a part of our family. That they'll feel like they belong, they feel closer to you, and that they can find healing and forgiveness in their life. God, we're so grateful that you're building something powerful and beautiful here. And we thank you for what's about to break out and break forth in our community. God, we follow you wherever you go. In Jesus' name, amen.